Well, I cannot resist starting in my usual way, and on this occasion, it's a particular greeting to you, Steve, because you're far away, and this is the distance greeting of the chimpanzee. <laughs> you, you can blame San Antonio for that because I was there yesterday and they have pollen of ragweed floating all over the place and everybody had bad throats and bad eyes and I nearly didn't get through the lecture but hopefully Los Angeles will cure that in the next yeah. four days. Yeah, the smog. So, <laughs> yeah, the smog, okay, well, hmm, yeah, never sure. mind, there's always something, isn't there? Yeah. Stay in Santa Monica. <laughs> Anyhow, the point is, you've just heard a master talking about a subject which has taken up um, almost 20 years of his life. Uh, he's got a legal mind, he's approached this from an absolutely impeccable legal position and the facts that he has uncovered through many 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 years of hard work and looking through thousands and thousands of pages of information obtained through the Freedom of Information Act has enabled him to say what he has said and Steve I don't know if this is meant to be a secret but uh, he has challenged Monsanto to read his book and if, if they find something that's wrong he will investigate and if they're proved right he will apologize and withdraw it. Was that okay Steve to say that? I hope so. Uh, because I think that first of all Monsanto hasn't replied and this was quite some time ago. They hope it'll go away but knowing Steve it will not go away and hopefully the book will be read by many, many people. I managed to get one into the hands of the, of the little committee be set up by the Pope to investigate GMOs. And, uh, I, I don't know what use will be made of it, but at least it got there and was received. So, and I, of course I mentioned it on Bill Meyer last night, so lots of people were here. I have, on the other hand, have not been spending years and years researching GMOs. I've been studying chimpanzees. Yes, However, I... Unite. I beg your pardon? Primates unite. <laughs> Primates, Primates unite. unite. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, the, the danger of GMOs was pointed out to me long, long ago in the UK, which was one of the first countries where there were scientists standing up to this new technology way back in the 70s or, or a, a early 80s and I had a friend who was extremely passionate who did his best to explain to me the technology by which foreign genes are inserted into these poor poor plants and he organized many groups going around pulling genetically modified foods out of the ground and he was put in prison a few times, as were the others with him. And so from that moment on, I became very much aware of GMOs, and then increasingly, not only of the danger to human health, which Steve has been talking about, but also danger to the environment. And I think this is such a huge, it, it's such a huge issue that the more angles we approach it from, the better we shall be able to join together to do something about this, what Steve calls this monstrous hoax. It is a monstrous hoax. And so as for the danger to the environment, the, the most widely used herbicide in the planet is called glyphosate. And glyphosate was the chemical that was used by Monsanto to develop the most widely used herbicide, Roundup. And when Monsanto also created uh, foods that were Roundup ready, they had resistance to the herbicide built into them. Therefore, the use of the of the uh, the, the use of the herbicide could now be increased dramatically. You could spray your fields 
you could do it by air, you could spray many more times than you could before because the crops that you were protecting from agricultural weeds would not die. However, some things happened as a result of that. First of all, some of the weeds, as had been predicted, began to build up resistance to this, uh, this uh, herbicide. And in fact, some farmers have had to give up farming because the weeds have grown so big and so strong that they break the harvesters. And they, this has happened to something called a pigweed. And it can now grow up to seven foot. And it has a, a, a stem as thick as a, a man's um, arm. And it normally grows, I don't know, about four foot, something like that. So that's, that's one uh, major problem. And glyphosate, and I don't know if any of you have seen this, because this actually is breaking news. I learned about it last week. So I had to make notes of the names, and I'm not even going to try and explain the whole story, but it's part of the deception. It's just one other thing to make people mistrust the statements that are made by Monsanto, Dow, uh, and uh, Syngenta, and the other organizations that are proponents of GMOs. And this was some information discovered by Dr. Anthony Samsel, and it is supported by Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who is a respected scientist at MIT. And so Dr. Anthony Samsel, rather as Steve investigated the documents in the early days of GMOs, he investigated documents about the early use of glyphosate. And he managed somehow or other to get hold of, um, what are they called, trade secret files. Trade secret files from the EPA, the Environment Protection Agency. And they told him, yes, you can take them and read them, but you cannot reproduce them, and you cannot share them, but you can share your views. This shows that in 1985, Monsanto's own tests showed that glyphosate could cause cancer. They've known since 1985. The tests, the test results that Monsanto has used to prove that glyphosate is safe are all based on tests done by the industry itself. And glyphosate is now, it's the amount of it used is absolutely shocking. It's used in China, it's used in the US, it's used in Argentina, and it's recently been banned by the World Health Organization. And <laughs> yes, but Monsanto, of course, is suing them. <laughs> Another environmental hazard which resulted from this uh, genetic engineering is the use of uh, use of a chemical <laughs> to protect the, the genetically engineered plant from insects. It's an insecticide, Bt. I'm not quite sure what Bt stands for, but Bacillus anyway. thuringiensis. Well, did you hear that? Bacillus <laughs> thuringiensis. Bacillus thuringiensis. Thuringiensis. Okay, but Bt will do for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier. So um, here we have now poor plants. They've had these, these genes stuck into them. They, they didn't give permission. <laughs> they hate it. They don't like it. I'm quite, quite sure. The last book I did, Seeds for Hope, took me through an amazing journey through the kingdom of the plants. And what I've learned about them is so incredible. And by the way, there is a chapter, a whole chapter on genetically modified um, foods. But anyway, so here we have these plants, and you can spray them crazily, and the insects won't eat them. Well, we predicted also that there would be insects that built up resistance to this pesticide, and indeed that has happened. So just as you have super weeds, you also have super bugs. And not only that, but there's pretty good evidence that glyphosate is harming the insects that actually are doing work for us. So the beneficial insects, particularly bees. 
If we lose bees and the other insects that pollinate, that will be the end of us because almost all our foods are pollinated by some kind of insect. There's also a few little animals and they're probably affected by this insecticide as well. So those, those environmental impacts are something which I find extremely disturbing. And of course, Monsanto encourages another bad aspect of the agribusiness, and that is monocultures. So you get fields and fields and fields of uh, genetically modified corn or even fields of normal crops. The modern agriculture is killing biodiversity and it is risking huge areas of food to destruction if, it, if some disease spreads and that will be very, very harmful for people. There's also another aspect of this genetically modified food in this agribusiness and the use of these pesticides and that is the terrible damage done to the local people living in the areas, particularly where crops are being sprayed with uh, Roundup. So those are all very harmful and I, I can't resist adding to what, what Steve said about the, the uh, tests on animals. You know, think of all the poor old rats, the laboratory rat. I, I don't know, we, we, we seem to think of rats as something that is just like a, you know, an object. But actually anybody who's known anything about rats knows they're highly intelligent. They've only become a nuisance with us because we're dirty and leave food around. And in the old prehistoric days, I'm sure rats probably formed quite a good service to people and cleared up some of the, some of the material that, that they didn't. At any rate, let's forget the rat for a moment. And let's think about pigs. Pigs are way more like humans than rats. In fact, that's why they're very often used by scientists who want to test products to see how a human might react because the pig, pig's organs are so like ours. So the first, uh, att my attention was drawn to this when I read a little article by a, I think he was a Dutch farmer or a, maybe a Belgian farmer, it doesn't really matter, a European farmer, let's say. And he'd kept pigs for 30 years, never had much problem. And then suddenly his pigs began doing badly, having less uh, piglets in the litter. They were, um, and, and, and they were having bad diarrhea. So this went on for a while and he thought, well, what's changed? Why are my pigs suddenly uh, not doing so well? And he thought, well, it was the, the food stuff that the European Union permits to be imported genetically modified corn and soy. So European Union farmers are mostly not allowed to grow these things, but the, uh, the animal feed can be imported. So he stopped feeding this, this genetically modified food to the pigs. And within a very short space of time, the diarrhea cleared up and the pigs were back to their old um, boisterous selves. So, okay, that's just a farmer, so that's no evidence, right? But then a scientist decided that she would investigate. So she went to a hog farm. She persuaded them to let her, I think it was 10, 12, I can't remember the number, uh, pigs in their farm that she could feed differently. Otherwise everything would be the same, but she would feed them corn and soy that was not genetically modified. And at the time when the pigs went to slaughter, her 12 pigs, uh, she was allowed to take the organs out, just the organs, and also the organs of 12 of the pigs that had been fed the genetically modified food. And the differences were shocking. You can read her paper, it's published. And there were all sorts of um, problems with, as Steve says, kidneys and liver, reproductive organs in the males and so forth. So the final thing that I want to say is that another of the thing that you hear, uh, I mean, I'm attacked very often by the people who are pro-GMOs saying, well, if you stop the use of genetically modified food, then millions of people are going to starve. The world's population is going up. The only way we can feed them 
is through, uh, through genetically modified food. And this is believed because the hype has been such and the advertising has been such and the lies have been so well perpetrated and the myth has been drawn down to blanket ice so that people like Bill Gates and Bill Clinton and Warren Buffett have uh, bought into this and are spending millions, billions probably altogether uh, of dollars in spreading genetically modified foods into Africa and maybe some other places too. It's not being proved in any single case that I've read, I could be wrong, and I'm not going to say this is absolute truth and I'm not a lawyer, but that the fields of genetically modified food have uh, great crops have not done better. They have not in any instance provided more than a field, similar uh, size field with a similar crop that wasn't genetically modified. So if you put all these different things together coming from all these different um, aspects of human health, of animal health, of environment, the loss of biodiversity, the build-up of of super bugs and super weeds to the detriment of farming and to the detriment of our future. So that's why I wrote the introduction to Steve's book because I'm very passionate about this but as I say it's not my subject, it's not my expertise but I've just shared with you some of the things that bother me and Steve has approved of the things that I've said in my book. So.